teachers and the civically virtuous who are generally curious about our constitutional system to the third season of the Constitution of American Life with us, the Friends of Publius. I do hope that you had a good summer break and that you were and are able to check out our summer series programs. As for myself, I can't say that summer was great, especially this last week dealing with the temperatures surpassing 110, but also I spent so much time injured and under the weather, which I interpret uh, as a challenge and a message from Yahweh regarding our humanness and vulnerabilities. But for students, just remember, it sucks getting old. All right. This season, we are gearing up for commentary and insights into issues like Article 6 and the idea of higher law, also the notion of nationhood and can a nation that is so diverse geographically, ethnically, and religiously truly become a united nation. We will also, uh, given this summer's decisions by the Supreme Court, we will spend some significant time providing insights into what I call the judicial oligarchy that our framers uh, created. And I'm looking forward to our discussion on civil discourse and whether or not we can model the ideal of civil discourse for you, which uh, based upon our, 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 our pregame conversation, I don't know if we can. For those of you who are new to the Constitution of American Life, I would like to introduce it, uh, to you the FOPs and provide you some background so that you might gain some insights into the various perspectives. To suffice it to say that most of us, uh, uh, Professor Williams and I knew each other uh, predating uh, in some ways the We the People program, but uh, the whole group here uh, became colleagues and friends through our association with the Center for Civic Ed, Education and the National We the People, the Citizen and the Constitution program. First, we have Professor Tim Moore, former We the People uh, teacher coach from Waukesha, Wisconsin, who now works for the Center on the Study of the Constitution at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Then we have Professor Chris Cavanaugh, a longtime teacher coach of We the People in a community south of Indianapolis, Indiana, and now teaches in Bismarck, North Dakota. Professor Cavanaugh uh, has been recognized by numerous organizations as one of the top civics teachers in the United States. Finally, we have our non-boomer, Dr. James Michael Williams, uh, professor of political science at the University of San Diego. Professor Williams' focus is on comparative politics with an emphasis on South uh, Africa. He is a longtime scholar for the We the People professional development programs, constantly in high demand and rated as one of the favorite scholars by teachers across the nation. And then there is me, the moderator of this prestigious group of scholars, David Richmond. I have been involved in some capacity with the We the People program since its inception in 1987-88. So tonight we are going to be focusing our discussion on liberty and the fundamental rights doctrine, substantive, substantive due process, and the doctrine of incorporation, specifically selective incorporation. So let's begin with our youngster here, Professor uh, Williams. I'm wondering if you can provide your working definition of liberty, because this, the question that kids have to deal with really deals with you know, liberty under uh, uh, specifically the 14th Amendment liberty clause. Uh, and I, you know, over the number of years that I worked, sometimes kids had a really interesting notion of liberty. Uh, so I'm wondering, what's your working definition of liberty as it is used in the question that students have uh, to deal with uh, and uh, as and, and constitutionally? Because, uh, you know, there's, there's constitutional liberty and then there's this generic general liberty uh, out there. And secondly, do you think most Americans today would define liberty differently than the founding framing generation? Okay. Well, it's... This is an interesting quote from an interesting case, right? Because this is a case that the students will find out when they do a little research, is where the court said a fundamental right did not exist, right? So the court's, Rehnquist is kind of saying there, due process means something other than just like fairness and process. But in this case, physician-assisted suicide, it doesn't rise to the level of being recognized as a fundamental right. Um, so what the court has defined as a liberty interest if it's not mentioned in the constitution which we'll get into i think in a little bit 
is it's a it's a, a liberty interest or a fundamental right that is so deeply part of our history <clears throat> that we can't ignore it. And some of the founders will <clears throat> look back in, in terms of the founding era to look for clues about what was considered by that generation. Um, and in the most recent decision in, in Dobbs, right, the court used that kind of logic to find that abortion was not something that was a fundamental liberty interest because it was not deeply rooted um, and they couldn't find evidence or they, the evidence they found, they didn't find it overwhelming, at least the majority, that, um, that at the founding period, it was a liberty interest. So, so starting there, it seems to me the way the court has, has developed this jurisprudence since like the 1930s, I would say, is to look back in time and ask, okay, what's something that's so essential to an ordered society, to a free society that we have to recognize it, even if it's not in the constitution explicitly? Um, I don't know, I didn't look at any poll data before getting in here, but I just know that in terms of your second question, would most Americans think that liberty is defined by what liberty was at the founding period. I doubt most people outside of, you know, academic or constitutional law circles would even fathom that sort of idea. I mean, liberty is the right to be left alone. And some might argue liberty is the right um, not only to be left alone, but to, um, I don't know, to have some support with things that you want to do, whether it's the right to vote or the right to certain other interests. So does that answer well, your question? Yeah, it, but would, I mean, would it be acceptable to you to say that most Americans have a libertarian notion of, uh, you know, a modern libertarian notion of liberty contrasting the framers, which had a much more classical sense and, and, and balancing that against the common good, it seems today, you know, uh, most Americans uh, fall into the libertarian and pretty much I can do whatever I want to do uh, with a few restrictions. Um, yes, in general, yes. There is some interesting research out there. Just this isn't exactly what you're asking, but it, it questions about like, um, should the government take a bigger role in certain aspects of our life? Right, especially in terms of like providing services, minimum wage, um, welfare, or, or that kind of stuff. It's interesting because it, it, yes, the majority of Americans are libertarians, but different um, racial groups have vastly different opinions of that. Um, Black Americans in research are much more likely to say that they think government should be playing a bigger role than white Americans, for example. Um, so I'd say in general, I would agree with that, but I think it would break down on a lot of different lines, racially, gender, political ideology, even generational, I think is, is gonna show some difference there. Tim or Chris, any, uh, any thoughts about that? About what Mike's has said or about this notion of liberty? I think you're, uh, I think you're right, David, on this libertarian um, streak. I mean, there, there are some at the founding period that would say you can't have liberty without a social contract. Uh, that without a social contract that actually creates some boundaries of behaviors, some rule book, um, there is no liberty because it's chaos. So the contract in itself, uh, that liberty can only exist within the bounds of something. Uh, there is that, and that's a philosophical answer. You asked the constitutional question. Mm -hmm. But I, I think it's something worth thinking about. Can you really have liberty uh, after a contract is uh, total freedom, to your point, the libertarian view of it. Uh, I think post-contract liberty is different than uh, total liberty pre-contract, if that, if that makes sense. I, I, I think a simple definition uh, for me, and, and Tim just kind of alluded to it as well, is that it's, uh, liberty is freedom with guardrails. Right. This is it's a, it, people talk about living in a we're free. Well, we're not really technically free. We have liberty because we have limits. And we've said many, many times on our broadcasts that, you know, we get the chance to exercise our right. But no right is absolute. There are limits. There are guardrails to keep me in my lane so I don't get in your lane. So, I mean, I think that's also going back to the founding era. I think that is, I don't think they would have said it that way, but I think that's exactly what Tim was alluding to is that you can't have liberty without control. So 
and there, there's, all, there's also some folks that would say, and this is this is really in in the weeds here philosophically is uh do people do individual people have liberty or do a collective people have liberty uh, and that has a lot to do with identity and how you configure society but there is this philosophical debate about individuals having liberty versus a collective people having liberty and i think the collective people view is tied into this notion of you have to have guardrails as chris said a contract social contract to define the, the liberties so professor moore and I, i'm sorry but you know one of the things especially later on in my uh, involvement with the people was uh was focused on to what degree do students understand some fundamental concepts or how do they understand some fundamental concepts. So students and teachers, I hope you bear with me, but I am kind of into a definitional phrase in, in my life. So I'm wondering, Professor Moore, if you could define and explain the concept of due process of law uh, <laughs> and describe kind of its genesis and evolution uh, there. And I'm wondering, uh, and I, I got to pay tribute to uh, my lovely wife on this, uh, she says that they were concerned about the absence of due process. What is the absence of due process which concerned the framers? So I know that's kind of a tiered question there, but simply define and explain due process and, and if you can tell what is it's genesis and evolution. Well, um, due process in many ways is an American phrase. Um, it, uh, the, the standard view of this is that the British use the phrase law of the land. Um, and that's a reference to like in, in, in the English system, in the common law system, uh, if, the, if something was in court or judges had to uh, make decisions, they would consult all the, all the acts of parliament and just the common law and tradition, and they would make a, make a decision. So that was deemed to be the law of the land. It's a very vague, actually, phrase, and it had a very, very broad meaning. Uh, Americans, um, as we're prone to do, we get really legalistic uh, in the way we think about constitutionalism. So um, I think the state of New York may have been the first to use the word due process of law. And uh, I've always understood it to mean that it's a little more precise than this amorphous law of the land, uh, a little too vague for Americans. So due process uh, moves Americans in the direction of actually defining those procedures more specifically, rather than relying on this amorphous concept of law of the land. Um, because in, in, in the British system, there are shires, that's the equivalent kind of there are counties or states. And so uh, people had to make decisions based upon differing laws and differing shires and and, and whatnot. So the origin of the word is actually English, law of the land, and we, we more, um, we're more prone to codify it with the phrase due process, um, if that makes sense. Now, the second part of your question is, um, if, if you mean, uh, I'm not quite sure what you mean by the framers, because, uh, because I mean, in the debate about the Constitution, the Federalists and Anti-Federalists, it's the Anti-Federalists are very concerned about well, a lack up, of... and, up until the Philadelphia Convention. Oh, OK. Uh, we, OK, yeah. so the, the genesis, as far as I understand, and I know it predates this, you know, some scholars, a lot of scholars go back to biblical times and the Bible sure. itself having principles of uh, due right. process. But the Magna Carta at least sure. from uh, from the legal you know constitutional point of view seems to be the birth of this notion of due process yeah. uh, and well, Magna i guess Carta, between between that and the 18th century you yeah. know were there key things that it evolved sure. and developed uh, there is it kind of an american western notion or is it is, is there a global idea to it uh, well, it, I mean, it, it has its, it actually predates Magna Carta too. There's some, uh, the, uh, it was called Aziz of Clarendon actually has makes references to various procedures that people were entitled to. Um, you know, one of the more comical one is if somebody's accused of a crime, uh, there are these rules about how many judges you have to go get to hear the case. And so, I mean, this is like 1160 something. Uh, it's <laughs> so it predates Magna Carta. So yeah, it, it's deeply rooted in English history, this idea of fair procedures. 
Um, in the uh, in the American colonial context, the Stamp Act is a big um, fork in the road, so to speak. Uh, I mean, there were all kinds of protestations by the various colonies about the Stamp Act and the procedures that weren't there if somebody was accused of violating the Stamp Act. Um, so again, it's it's largely a, a legal judicial concept um, that's missing there for the for those folks in the 1760s. Uh, one of the intolerable acts uh, eliminates local uh, juries and and uh, and local due process procedures and uh, um, admiralty courts are created. So so yeah the colonials are very uh, very attuned to fair procedures very much so and, and it precedes the federalist anti-federalist debates i mean if we want to get into that we can do that but if you would if you want to stay pre-creation of the constitution yeah there are these punctuated moments where uh, uh british colonials are very keen to this idea of procedures being violated or fair procedures not being there so is it fair to say that they you know th they they believed that there was no way to have a constitutional republic without due process of law. Absolutely. That, that that's one of the cornerstones to a constitutional republic is due process of, of law, uh, not only criminal due process, but other forms of due process. Yes. Is that accurate? Correct. And Absolutely. they built and they built that into numerous articles of the Constitution. Would that be correct? Uh, well, sure. I mean, even the rules about how the co Congress is supposed to operate, those are kind of procedural issues uh, of fairness, I guess, uh, assuming that the Senate is fair. <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of processes in the system, how the system, as Cayman said, is supposed to work by itself. So, I, and again, I don't want to get into presentism because I know how the you people at University of Wisconsin uh, don't like presentism. Uh, uh, these days, if I uh, follow the trend of the American Historical Association's president from the University of Wisconsin. So I'll save presentism for our other guys later on in the discussion. Uh, so, uh, Chris. I can't believe you I, went there. Oh, my. Uh, of course I went there. I've enjoyed uh, the discussion about uh, 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 of that uh, okay, uh, so-called controversy uh, there. So, I, I, you know, the, the Fifth Amendment and the Fourteenth Amendment say you cannot deny life, liberty, or property without due process of law. But does the Constitution treat, you know, or how does the Constitution treat the loss of property differently than the loss of liberty? Do they treat, does it treat it differently, and to what degree, how so? I think the loss of liberty is equated to the loss of property. Then know. why did they, why did they, you know, categorize, categorize it in, as a different category. If it was just, if property is liberty, why not just say life liberty? Why did they put property as a separate category? Well, I, I would go back to um, uh, everybody's favorite, including uh, AP Gov with the uh, Federalist number 10, but I wouldn't deal with Federalist number, and you've heard me say this before, it's not the idea of factions. If you read what Madison says about the ability for people to acquire property and the faculties of men he writes about these different faculties for acquiring this property and the, the first role of government is to be able to protect the ability of people to acquire this property so he writes this in bed tennis and this from from this different interests and these different abilities to acquire property, this is where you get factions. So I know in, in AP Gov, they love to talk about Fed 10 and factions and all that. But there are some other things in there that he writes about the acquisition of property. And I think Madison also is the guy that famously said that uh, not only do you have a right to your property, but you have a property in your rights. So, um, you know, and I'm not going to channel uh, Charles Beard, but uh, I might. <laughs> um, that, you know, go go Badgers. Okay. <laughs> well, yeah. um, you know, if you think about the idea of the lead up to the Constitution, and one of the big events, of course, is Shays' Rebellion that we talk about. Uh, we know that there are farmer revolts up and down the 13th. <laughs> um, so, and it, this is upsetting the apple cart for the people with property. So the idea is how do we secure our property and we have to have a stronger central government. And so even though you don't necessarily see uh, 
other than perhaps I would allude to or uh, point out for students, um, Article 1, Section 10, uh, Clause 1, the obligation of contracts. Uh, this is protected. You know, states can't deny this because creditors were not getting paid back, and that was a big deal. Um, so that is that is in the body of the Constitution itself. David, to, as to your question, why do they delineate between liberty and property if it is somewhat synonymous? I think it's just to be more definite. I think it's to be well, more. You know, and this comes from a, a former colleague of mine. They said, you know, when it comes to due process and criminal justice and liberty, there's this concept of jeopardy and, and don't, uh, you know, apply, but not in property. And, and I actually had really no response to that. I didn't know how to respond to that. Do you agree with that? That the concept of jeopardy is one way to delineate. And in fact, it elevates liberty rights relative to due process to a higher level than property rights. I don't know that I don't know because I think there are other protections when you look at the fifth, right? Such as the takings clause in eminent domain. That is that there and obviously you as you read a little further in the fifth, you, know, you have that protection that, you know, the, those are your property rights and, and you know the takings clause. And we've seen, you know, old school case law and very modern case law about the government being able to seize property through the takings clause or the eminent domain. And not just eminent domain, uh, not just like uh, you know, my land, but also can you seize my vehicle if it was used in the commission of a, a felony? You know, that's part of the takings clause. And so I don't, I think jeopardy is attached to property. I, I think, I, I don't, I don't know that I would separate out the two. So I'm, I don't know if I'm understanding. Tim, did you want to jump in? Yeah. Uh, a couple things. I, to your original question, David, I, I kind of have always taken the view that they're always riff, they're, they're riffing on lock. Um, and, and to Chris's point earlier, uh, he sees rights, Locke defines rights as property. Uh, he configures them that way in the second treatise. So um, when those phrases show up in our documents, I, I've, I've always kind of seen it, seen it as kind of a, not a legalistic statement per se, but more of a philosophical tip of the hat to our origins in Locke. Another thing about takings is interesting, Chris raised I think the takings clause in our constitution is there for a couple of reasons. One, um, I mean, British creditors um, were not getting uh, their property back. And in other words, a, a government had taken their property during the war. And so there's a takings clause there. And this is where the anti-federalist CC, it's a, bro, a pro-British constitution because it favors these British people who lost their properties or confiscated properties during the war. And also, many of the founders believe that there's going to be a whole lot of takings taking place if they create canals into the western parts of some of these states. In other words, there'll be private properties taken for the construction of public projects like canals. So I think it looks, in other words, my point is the takings clause kind of looks backwards to the revolution and some takings that took place unjustly. But it also looks forward to, at the time, that canals could fit in that category of, of folks losing some turf. Well, of course, and, and just to be sure, too, that the students understand, we're talking about the Fifth Amendment, which is not going to be added until 17, ratified until 17. Right, right, so right. The body of the Constitution itself, we're talking a very limited view, I think, of property or property rights, other than perhaps protecting the loyalists, as Tim alluded to, or creditors, uh, you know, uh, at the state level. Yeah, but... So, go ahead, Mike. I'm sorry, to David's point, okay... To David's point, in the body of the Constitution before the Bill of Rights, based on the conversation we were just having, there's probably more in there about the protection of property in terms of material things than there is about the protection of a right. I mean, right. I, both, yeah. I think, and when we get to the Bill of Rights, uh, it was Chris's comment, it's the takings clause that's had me thinking about this. It's interesting, right? Because like we have the First Amendment, for example, it talks about a liberty right to freedom of speech. Um, we all know that light rights are not absolute, but there's nothing in there saying what happens when the government takes away your freedom of speech. The, the takings clause is interesting because it's highlighting private property. It's saying it's not absolute, which I think we'd all be in agreement with. That's what the founders thought. But it provides explicit language without just compensation. So it's like, <laughs> And this is where I'm, I'm way out of my 
my depth in this. And I'm Tim, loving it. I'm loving Tim, it. Tim, you may you may know exactly what the founders are thinking with this, but they had the language and the logic to put in there without just pro- compensation for property. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of constitutions around the world that spell out what happens or how a government could take a right away. Um, and we now have statutes, right, that provide people with rights, civil rights that you can go to court and, and get get um, get compensation if the government yeah. takes away a civil right. But that doesn't come until the, I think that's in the 1880s, actually. Anyways, I'm, I'm rambling because I just found all this interesting and I was just, I was just connecting the dots right here on live television. Look at that. Yeah. Uh, well, no, I like it. I think that's a, 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 an interesting point uh, uh, between the, the First and the, the Fifth Amendment. Uh, but we, we do have to move on, Professor Williams. And uh, now I want to get into kind of the meat of the question, which deals with the case of Washington versus Glucksburg, uh, which uh, in 1997 which dealt with an interesting topic, physician-assisted suicide uh, and the right to die. Uh, There's a liberty right that's uh, fascinating. Um, But more importantly for us, it deals with this concept of substantive due process, uh, which uh, some scholars debate the existence. Is there truly something that the framers understood as substantive due process uh, there? So, and, and, I'm going to move out. We don't really need, hopefully the students by now, they know what procedural due process is because how much process are you due? It's really in the whole phrase. But this notion of substantive due process, at least in my experience, Professor Williams, I, I found some kids struggled with that. So can you, one, explain what substantive due process uh, is and why in the late, uh, you know, I, I shouldn't say late, but why in the 20th and 21st century, Due pro- substantive due process has become, in some ways, equally as uh, significant and important as procedural. Okay, I'll start this off, but I know that Chris and Tim and you all, you all could carry on this conversation, so I'll start it off. So, uh, <laughs> first of all, I, I want to say that I, uh, in law school, I think most of uh, my friends in law school, we didn't understand substantive due process all that well. Uh, <laughs> So if there are, there are high school students out there that are struggling with it, I think uh, you should know it's, these are difficult concepts to get your head yeah. around. Um, but let me try, let me see if this works. So a procedural due process right is like that the government's saying, um, we may be able to take something away, away from you, a right, but we can't do it until we set up a process that is fair. So you can hear all the evidence, you can understand our logic, and then if we wanna take it away from you, we will. Substantive due process is, one way to think about it is, this is something that's so fundamental that even if the government sets up a fair process, they shouldn't be able to take it away from you. It's that fundamental. Um, and in the case of substantive due process, it's, um, it comes out of a reading of the 14th Amendment. <laughs> and I think the short answer as to why we have it, and I've, I'm just echoing what my good friend Chris often says, it's because the court blew it with the privileges and immunities clause um, in the slaughterhouse cases. That's, a, we, the court was kind of struggling after that case to find some rights that they wanted to recognize, more in the sphere of contract rights and private rights, but it, it then takes a turn in the 1930s. Um, I'm gonna leave it there because I'm not sure if I did more harm than good in my explanation. I'm gonna let Chris and Tim chime in. No, I think that was, I think that was solid. I, I have a, and don't worry, Mike, uh, back in the day in Indiana, I had the, the privilege of having an Indiana Supreme Court justice in my classroom. And the first question the kids asked was, could you please define substantive due process? <laughs> and uh, uh, the, and I, that, that justice will remain nameless, but uh, that was a struggle for him. Yeah. And, uh, but I think, and you guys correct me, I, I, th- I this is a really simple definition. Is the substance of the law fair? Is that, is that oversimplified? Is that clear enough? So to think about it, it's, does it treat people, all people, fairly and equally? Well, how does it, can I ask you, Chris, how does that distinguish itself from equal protection? Um, I don't know that it does. I don't know that it does, but also it, it, throw, it goes into the idea because I think when you think about substantive due process, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull in one of Tim's favorite 
clauses of the Constitution, actually the Bill of Rights, and that'd be the Ninth Amendment. I know that's one of his favorites. I think he's got it tattooed somewhere on his body. Um, maybe, I don't know. Uh, but the idea is we know that there are rights that we don't, we haven't recognized in this one through eight, right? Um, as Mike alluded to in procedural due process, amendments four through eight, they're, they're your procedural due process rights. From the minute the cop pulls you over to the minute the jail door slams behind you, there are steps the government has to follow to make sure you're treated fairly under the law. But the idea of, is the substance of the law fair? Does it treat people equally? And you're right, David, in the idea of, of uh, equal protection, but understanding it to the point that in 1791, we don't know what we may find. We don't know what we may recognize as right. So I think, and, I, and, I, and I'm, 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 for the people watching for the first time, I was being very facetious about Tim and the Ninth Amendment. So uh, hopefully you picked up on that sarcasm. Um, but I do believe the Ninth Amendment serves a purpose. And I think substantive due process absolutely serves a purpose to, to think about groups that were not recognized in 1791, groups that were not recognized until after 1865, groups that were not recognized until 1920, right? And groups that we're still thinking about recognizing today. So I, I need some, I, I have a couple, a, a clarification question to all of you and then a, a point. Is my understanding, Chris, Substantive due process predominantly uh, applies to legislative or lawmaking branches, that the substance of the law must be fair and reasonable, where procedural due process can, can apply to a whole other, you know, a lot of different realms, the yeah. legislative as well as the judicial executive, you know, at this, you know, and, you know, after the 14th Amendment gets incorporated kind of stuff. Uh, you know, uh, but you also seem to imply that substantive due process was in the minds of the original framers. And my understanding is the mention of substantive due process doesn't even come about until Roger Taney and Dred Scott. Now, and I could be really confused. So, no, again, you are not, my friend. Oh, you are okay. not. In other words, uh, Preacher Moore, go ahead. Can I get a witness? A witness. Um, I think hey. this, this point is, uh, now I, I'm not I'm not willing to go so far as the the framers had this, but Tawny. I mean, think about the awfulness of what Tawny's logic, and it gets to Mike's point that there's some right that is so superior to all procedures. I mean, this is why Tawny says I don't care about the Missouri Compromise. I don't care that uh, the legislature talked about this for a year, what to do with Missouri. Um, I don't care that dread, you know, I don't care. There is a right for me to own a person that trumps all legislative debate, that trumps all, that trumps everything. I, so I would just recommend the idea of substantive due process, actually, maybe ground zero is Dred Scott, where this right of prop and it's property, <laughs> this right of property is so superior to everything that Tawny can strike down um, all kinds of legislation duly debated and went, and went through the process. That substantive due process decision in Dred Scott, pre-14th. So, so yes. I, think you're, I think you're onto something there, David. I, well, I would agree with that, but I'm gonna go back to my point with the Ninth Amendment. And I'm not saying that they had substantive due process in their brains. I, I, I'm not gonna go that far to even think about that. But I do think there is that, I think the Ninth Amendment is that safety net, right? And, and, and I think it gets uh, short shrift uh, in, in, in jurisprudence. And uh, to go back to the privilege, yeah. which by the way, the privileges and immunities, also privileges or immunities are found in Article 4 before it's found in the 14th. So I think there's something to be to, uh, spoken to there as well. But I do think the Ninth Amendment is a, a way to say, you know what, there are probably some other rights we haven't thought about. We're not sure yet. Uh, we're very young. We're just starting. So let's move forward and see what happens. And I, I'll be honest, Chris, I, that I, I'm, I'm actually fascinated by that argument that substantive due process is kind of a way, whether backdoor or not, to bring to life the Ninth Amendment on the enumeration of, well, of, I, of other rights. I'd like to push uh, back a little bit on, and it's not just the Ninth Amendment, because I think I think Chris is right. The Ninth Amendment needs some explanation. 
uh, okay, what are the, and, and even the Declaration of Independence, among these rights are. So there are, there are phrases in our history that somebody needs to explain to us the meaning of them. But I'm going to suggest that's one thing. It's another thing to say that if we find this right in the Ninth Amendment, that, it, that it's so superior, it could never be limited. I think there's two different things there. Finding rights in the Ninth Amendment, I, don't, you know, I joke all the time about it's ridiculous, but I guess if I'm put in a corner, I would say that's legitimate for somebody, and in our system, it's the courts, to define what's in that Ninth Amendment. But then the next step is to make it so superior, to put I, it in substantive due process. I, that's where I get a little nervous. I'm not saying it's superior. I'm just saying that there are people that may be, or, and let's, let's deal with the case at hand, right? A physician assisted suicide or death with dignity, uh, depending on how you want to word it. And, and Tim, you kind of stole my thunder because, you know, whenever I teach the Declaration of Independence, when Jefferson writes, among these, Right. So the implication is there are others. What are they? And so if I have the right to my life and it's my life, do I have the right to decide when and how to end it? Not in a theocracy, you don't. Ooh, is rent well, you don't you don't need God to do that. You can have societies to do. Oh, that. Well, OK, don't be flippant because you know very well, Professor Moore, that the whole origins of, of the resistance to the right to die is found in theology. Right. It's not a, it, it's you, not a, you, a secular you, notion. If you read the opinion uh, in, in, the, in the case, in the question, right? If you read, go back to Cruzan versus Missouri, uh, the Missouri uh, is, uh, Department of Health, and that's in 1990, right? Then you get the Terry Schiavo case. So there's, there's a history there of reluctance to acknowledge that. And my argument would be that among these, so if it is my life, and it, we want to, see, and you read what Rehnquist says in Cruzan, you read what he says in is it uh, is it Washington? What's the what's the case in the, with the quote? I'm sorry, I don't even. Glucksburg. 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 Yeah. So if you read what he says here. It's all about this idea that it's not there. But uh, Tim's right. Someone needs to define what does among these mean, because that means there are others. And if it's my life, and you're going to protect it, then you know what. If I'm in a position where I know that I'm going to die a slow, painful death that is going to uh, cost my family lots of money, it's going to cause all kinds of issues. And if I can go through a lot of different checks that are built into these laws, I should be able to say I want to die with dignity. Well, Chris, I think I, I think. Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to. Well, the, the point is, back. then the question becomes, can a physician help me with that? Because now you're bringing in another person. Because obviously, if I wanted to, you know, uh, do harm to myself, I can do that, uh, even though it may be against the law in some places. But well, now to, to, to your rhetorical device, as somebody's got to define that, it seems to me, Chris, that the court did that for you this summer. All right. Uh, when we look at the so-called fundamental rights doctrine, uh, you know, there, you know, one of the questions, and I think, in, and again. Uh, I, I believe the phrase at one time by Cardoza was the scheme of ordered liberty right. uh, there. And I don't know to what degree that still lives on, but Justices Alito and Thomas, it seems to me, has said to us, whether it's unenumer to enumerate unenumerated rights or whether it's substantive rights, you know, to find substantive rights, you know, that may not have existed in 1791, we need to go back to the culture and, and minds of the framers of 1787, 88, or 1868 and find out what did they believe and what they understood as rights at that time can now be construed in 2022 as a right this time. So they've given us the answer. It must exist in history. If it didn't ex exist in history, then it can't be an a new enumerated or unenumerated right and it can't be a substantive right. Are you not satisfied with that? I mean, what, how do you respond to Alito and Thomas on this notion of fundamental rights doctrine? This is a family show, right? Oh. <laughs> I don't know. It's, uh, I'd be surprised if any family sat around and watched this, but if you want to call it a family show, um, you go right ahead. Kids, kids, the FOPs are on, be quiet. 
case you alluded to earlier was Palco versus Connecticut with Cardozo's ruling uh, establishing the fundamental test, the two-prong test. Is it necessary for a scheme of order liberty and is it deeply rooted in American tradition, right? So, and they decided for Mr. Palco that double jeopardy was not. So Connecticut, you tried him again and now you get to kill him, right? So, and then they will incorporate that right using the 14th Amendment in Benton v. Maryland in the 60s. So the court reverses itself. As to Alito and Thomas, um, wow, I just, I just, I, I, I'm not a Jeffersonian, but I'm going to channel my inner Jeffersonian here. The, the, the life or the world, the, the earth belongs to you, us in usufruct, right? And the idea that the people that are sitting on the court today are going to make decisions and say, well, if it wasn't written in 1787, or if it wasn't ratified in 1791, then we don't get to enjoy that right. Is that your question? Is that your point? Well, I that, think, it, no, it wasn't that Alito's and Thomas's yes, point? It, it was, and I think, that's, I, think that's, I think that's flipping ludicrous because it, in just in the Dobbs decision, they never mentioned the idea of quickening, right? And the idea when, when, when a, a, a pregnancy be terminated because the term quickening was used quite a bit in the colonial era and in the early states and early state laws in terms of ending a pregnancy. And they don't even allude to that in that decision. So the idea that they're, you know, I think uh, originalism has been revealed to be. A, 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 okay. A, so you or uh, uh, you know, uh, Professor Moore, Professor, what, how would you define a fundamental right? You don't accept Alito and Thomas and the way they've done it through originalism. So how would you define a fundamental right in 2022? How I, oh, yeah. I, how would I define the fundamental right? Yeah, you said they're ludicrous. So give me a counter argument. Well, I think that, you know, I, I, I don't disagree with, with Cardozo, but we also understand as we move forward that, you know what, uh, as under the privileges and immunities of citizenship, I should be able to marry who I want. Right. As long as it doesn't, uh, I, you know, we get into like Reynolds decision about multiple marriages and polygamy. There becomes an issue then with, you know, who has custody of children. That's a case for the students to take a look at. It's a very interesting case as Utah coming into the union. Um, so I do think that Cardozo's framework and, and Palco is not a bad framework. But I think, again, we go back to the idea of substantive due process is the substance of the law fair. Do we treat Car wait, 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 wait. Cardoza is what sets up Alito and Thomas here, rooted in tradition. But I, but I think there's more to it than that. I yeah, did, but I, the other, the other prong, I think, plays to Chris's argument. It, and necessary for a scheme of order liberty. Yeah, I mean, so it was ordered liberty the same uh, in 2022 as it was in 1791. So, so I, I don't see, I see those two prongs of Cardozo's test is really getting at different things. They're not saying the same thing. It, it, that, that's how I would look at it. Okay. I would, so, I would throw privileges and immunities. Again, as Mike alluded to, I would bring that back as well, because as a citizen of this country, I'm entitled to certain privileges or immunities that everyone should have. There's there even, and I, I'm not disagreeing with you, Chris, but um, this whole process of even if it's privilege and immunities, who gets to decide what's the framework or the methodology to find that? It's, yeah. It becomes very elitist, right? And it becomes, it, I was kind of thinking, you know, Dave, your question was, what's a fundamental right? The easiest answer is rights that are explicitly mentioned in the text are, we could say, are fundamental. The problem is, I think, is that our constitution doesn't allow align with our political culture. And it hasn't aligned for quite a long time. And what's problematic about the court taking on this role is that the court kind of becomes like a parliament in that they can create rights and take them away. Like they did it with Lochner. They did it with the right to contract. They've now done it with the right to abortion. They could do it with the right to marriage. I think the answer, I mean, for me, if the court were to come out and say, if a majority were to say, look, this substantive due process framework is bogus. Any right that's ever been recognized through that process is no longer a right. I bet there would be much more energy 
to amend the constitution to get things in it like does a parent have a right to raise their kid which is one of the fundamental rights recognized through substantive due process yeah. is there a right to marry is there a right to privacy those are all things that are not in the constitution explicitly but we have come accustomed to think in living in a in a ordered liberty focused society we should have those um but this method it seems to me we're never we're always going to bicker and it's always going to be sometimes it's a riot sometimes it's not or it could be taken away and i just don't think that's a, a healthy way to run a, a constitutional republic you know and, and you guys know that uh, justice scalia is probably not uh one of my favorite justices but he did write a concurrence in cruzan in the cruzan case in 1990 and the concurrence was interesting because he, at least he was consistent in this uh, as he moved forward in the case, you know, in the abortion cases, that the, the court should not be ruling on this, right? They didn't think this was something that should get to the court. This is something that should be handled through the legislative process. But I think that's also somewhat of a cop out because when states enter into this and states put these restrictions there, who do you go to, right? And through the appellate process to seek some type of justice, not necessarily compensation, but to, to test to see whether or not the law is fair or not, or how I'm being treated under the law is fair. But at least Justice Scalia was like, this is this shouldn't even have gotten to us. This is we don't have we have no business in making this decision about whether or not a parents can remove uh, the feeding tube for their daughter who's in a, a vegetative state. I guess I have a I have a response to uh, Alito and Thomas is uh, like. Uh, I mean, the, in a sense, they're honest by saying fundamental right equals the stuff that they talked about a lot at the founding. OK, and that's easy enough to do. I mean, uh, I'll, I'll send in a document we can post with this. It's basically a chart that has all of the rights uh, in state constitutions that kind of preceded our constitution. So if you wanted to find out what fundamental rights are, you just look at what the state constitution and the colonial charters, you look at it you can, you know, and you make a list. Well, that'd be an easy enough process. But the problem I would say, uh, Justice Alito, and I can't even believe I'm gonna say this, is we have other words in our constitution that seem to say it's not static. In other words, these are not frozen in time. Words like, the Ninth Amendment, words like privilege and immunity. So I would say to them that they're partially right, do a little historical research and make the list of what was important fundamentally at the time. But the problem is we have a text that seems to infer an evolutionary system. And I, to, to Chris's point all along here, that may be the Ninth Amendment, that may be the privilege and immunities. We're not frozen in time, uh, because of those phrases. And if we don't want the Ninth Amendment to mean anything, and that's another discussion, then it's easy to do fundamental rights. You just make the list from the founding. But the Ninth Amendment, <laughs> that's the fly in the ointment. So that, that's it. Go ahead, Mike. Oh, no, you go ahead, David. No, no, no. Okay, I just had two more things, and these might be a little off. But the Ninth Amendment, like, the, the phrase retained by the people, it seems to me that's much more small d democratic. It changes the way a court might choose to interpret this. At the same time, I don't know if I'm comfortable with the court looking at polling and deciding <laughs> people today in this generation think a right means whatever. I don't think that's it. Um, so I, I do think we can't make the constitution so, so like blowing with the wind with what each generation wants. That doesn't seem right. Um, John Hart Eli, I believe, in his book had a, he had an, an argu argument about this, right? And he kind of looked at if, if through the democratic process, if groups could not get certain rights that were super important recognized because they just kept getting outvoted by majority. I think he kind of said in his, I'm forgetting what the book was called. Uh, Democracy and Distrust. Yeah. Didn't he make that argument that that's when the court should step in and find the fundamental right? He, he linked it to the democratic process and he linked it to this idea of minorities, Chris's point earlier, to minority groups somehow being abused by a majority or not being able to get something. So, yeah. I would uh, refer kids to uh, Justice Jackson's opinion in the flag salute cases, right? 
in uh, West Virginia v. Barnett, and that and we've alluded to in other programs. I think it's just so, such powerful, powerful words about uh, some rights are placed beyond majority control, or that he uses the word vicissitudes of the majority. And I, I always use this line, and I, I can never find it, so maybe I'm making this up. I was, I might be, but I, I thought it was Madison that said that uh, morality is not a function of arithmetic. Hmm. And the idea. So, this is a good point for transition because this notion of substitute process, which is, in my opinion, vague and not alluded to too much in the 19th century, explodes in the 20th century. And that has to do with the doctrine of incorporation, Professor uh, Moore. And in that early period of, uh, of discussion about this doctrine of incorporation, I'm going to say there were two camps, and I don't know if there truly were two camps and whether or not it. Oh, okay. Yeah, don't do that to me. Uh, whether I, I'm not, anticipating, I'm anticipating yeah. your question. I, yeah. I kind of what, have an answer. Whether or not it was Hugo Black versus the world, because Hugo Black, you know, was clearly into total incorporation. Uh, and it seems to me most everybody else was into selective, uh, and selective incorporation won out. So can you briefly, Professor Moore, explain the difference between total incorporation and selective? And, and once you're done with that, I have a follow-up. Well, uh, incorporation is basically saying to states, you now have to abide by the Bill of Rights. Uh, now, many states already were, but there were some states that didn't provide the same protections uh, as the national constitution. So incorporation is basically the court saying state of Alabama or state of Connecticut or whatever state, you have violated a right. You now, um, that's a problem. And we are now going to incorporate that right. And it's binding on you. Because remember, the, ver the First Amendment uh, and the Bill of Rights is a restriction on the national government. And so the 14th Amendment, when it says no state shall, has been interpreted to mean that now states cannot abridge these freedoms. So uh, incorporation is that process of making states abide by the Bill of Rights. Now, the re um, and there, there was a very early fight in this idea of incorporation as to whether the entire Bill of Rights one through eight should all be forced upon, incorporated upon the states all at once. Well, our history, uh, Americans, um, well, folks in judicial uh, settings are generally pretty cautious. Um, total incorporation of all the rights in one through eight would be kind of a radical move for American jurisprudence. So what they did is they slowly incorporated individual rights one at a time. Sometimes they use this fundamental rights doctrine. Oh, that's an important one. Maybe we should incorporate that one first. And they started making judgment calls about which were important and which weren't. Um, the reason I've got this, uh, this, this is a toy that our kids had. I think every, every home. And I still have that had. toy. It helps me with my dexterity and my critical <laughs> thinking skills. Well, I, we, uh, back in the day when I was in the classroom, I used this to illustrate incorporation. And so uh, here you have these little shapes and, uh, oh, this, this kids is Cantwell versus Connecticut, uh, you know, the establishment clause now is incorporated and it goes and it slips through the 14th Amendment liberty. It slips through the opening and now inside states have to abide by that right. Oh, here's Palco or here's Minnesota versus Near, or here's Gitlow versus New York. Each one of those shapes, think of it as a right. And when it slips through the opening, that's in the incorporation process, incorporating them onto the states. It slips inside the ball. Um, and, there's, uh, and, it, and it illustrates selective or gradual incorporation. Uh, if you were going to incorporate all at once, you'd, uh, you'd separate those two sides of that ball and you'd dump them all in all at once. Well, we opted not to do that. Well, then that leads to the question. I like your phrase, slips through the opening, which I imagine so-called constitutional conservatives would have a little problem uh, uh, with uh, here. So to what, what impact does the fact that the court chooses to go down the selective incorporation – 
what impact does it have on the evolution of rights in American society? I mean, does it impact American society differently versus if we had adopted Hugo Black's notion that it's just, it's, they're all incorporated. Did that have an impact on our constitutional evolution, in your opinion, that we chose, or the, at least the majority of the court chose, to do selective? And that's to you, Tim, and, and to everybody oh, else. Um, well, I, um, we're not prone to do things uh, radically. Um, I also want to, I would suggest it kind of was an experiment to see, uh, I mean, just at a very basic procedural level, um, you'd get a chance to see how states would react to individual incorporation. Um, and then it might be a more, more palatable way for states to accepting this National Bill of Rights being forced upon them. See, I'm going I'm to push back a little bit because I think that if you, and this is, this is another problem I have with originalism, because we know that the 14th Amendment, in, its, in essence, is almost like a second convention, yeah. how it uses the balance of power, um, especially with, well, if you look at the 13th with the enforcement clause, the enforcement clause in the 14th, the enforcement clause in the 15th, giving Congress this power. Um, if you go back to Bingham, John Bingham from Ohio, the congressman who's really one of the primary authors of the 14th, and if you look at the congressional debates, they understood that through the 14th, all rights in the Bill of Rights would now protect people from state governments as well. So and, you like that originalism, but you don't like the other. <laughs> well, I, well, I mean, if you're going to talk about what was intended by the framers sure. of the 14th. No, I, that was snarky on my part, but no, uh, I, yeah. I do like that originalism, by the way. Yes, I do. <laughs> but um, another case for students to maybe to take a look at when you're talking about incorporation is the U.S. versus Crookshank. Uh, in like 1876, it's on something like 1870 something. And it, uh, that's a very interesting case. And this is one of the first cases where the court is actually thinking, okay, uh, what do we do with this Bill of Rights and how does this apply? Is it going to be uh, piecemeal? Are we going to take one shape and put it in there one at a time? Or is it going to apply to everybody all at once? And I think that uh, the framers of the 14th and the, con and the Congress that ratified it say, well, no, they, they protect everybody now. And then you also get into the issue of does it limit only government or does it limit individuals? Does it limit businesses? And we know and students know by this point, and teachers know that that opens up so much case law because we're doing it piecemeal and applying the uh, protections of these not only as against the government, but against individuals as well as businesses. So. Mike, uh, Professor, do you have any thoughts about uh, that that topic of incorporation uh, and the impact on rights? Or yeah, I just I'm just thinking about the F word. I'm thinking about federalism and how how it's ironic's not the right word. It's just this notion that we have these nas these national rights, and then it's this struggle for decades to get it to apply to states where most of the people, like we all know that it's state and local law that most people are kind of dealing with on a daily basis. And it just, I, as, as Chris was talking, as I was thinking, I was thinking this notion about spreading rights to different places around the world, right? And what kind of like a fool's errand that might be given that We've had this pro trying to spread it to 50 states. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just kind of like, wow, this, the, as much as we like to say we're freedom loving and stuff, it's getting rights and maintaining rights in this country. Uh, it's always been a struggle. It's always been a fight, either with civil society or with lawyers. Why, why do you think, Mike, why do you think that is? Why should we, if you, and I'm not disagreeing with you, but I think it's an interesting question. Why has it been a struggle to say we should treat people equally and fairly? I think my because it's not part of our foundation. Change, yeah. change is change is difficult. Remember, I'm sorry, but and I'm going to piss off half of America. But we are founded as a racist society. All right, and 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 that racism, or if you have another word for it, go ahead and throw it in there. Is is fundamental to our whole identity, Chris, and we have a civil war over that. I'm, and I'm, you and I both know that even with 
the end of the Civil War and the victory of the Union, it takes another hundred years for the ideals of the amendments and the declaration, you know, the amendments of the Civil War and the declaration, you know, to come to fruition. Why? Because change is so difficult, especially in a country that deifies its constitution. But you just made an argument for gradualism, time. David. I think you're, you're, you've perfectly articulated selective gradual incorporation because change isn't easy. Well, I didn't mean to, but what I find interesting uh, there, Professor Moore, it seems to me now in 2022, we've pretty much ended up with total incorporation. Because at the time that debate's going yeah. on, there was no discussion of the Second right. Amendment, the Third Amendment, the Seventh Amendment, all right? Uh, and now the Second Amendment, and I would argue to some degree the Third Amendment has through the right to privacy, because if anything reinforces the right to privacy, the Third Amendment does. And I think parts of the Seventh Amendment has been incorporated uh, there. So maybe, you know, black one out in the long run. And we have ended up in some degree with total incorporation. So we need to wrap this up. And so I, so our tradition is, if you have any insights to uh, for students who are dealing with unit three, question three on this, uh, on these topics of fundamental rights and corporation, liberty and things, uh, what would those be? Professor Kavanaugh? Um, just, I mean, I think we alluded to this earlier, and Mike did, uh, talking about his experience in law school, and, and when I mentioned the justice from the Indiana Supreme Court, substitute due process is a hard concept to wrap your head around. It really is a very difficult concept. It's difficult for people that have been studying this for a long time and, and have studied law. So understand that it's okay to be confused by some of this stuff. Um, but think about this, and we kind of alluded to, or mentioned this, how should Americans be treated by the government? And if the government's going to step in to limit a right or a liberty, uh, what is their motivation, right? They have to have a compelling state interest, or as I like to call it, a damn good reason. So when you wrestle with these individual issues, whether it's a physician assisted suicide, death with dignity, as the case, uh, case law in this question is, um, think about how you believe that should be handled. And then make your arguments from that point. But understand that this is a difficult thing to, to wrestle with. Professor Moore? Yeah. And, uh, and adding on to that, I think students need to think about how a substantive due process, uh, both the right and the left, like it <laughs> for certain things. Like, for example, uh, the right. I, I, the way I read the headlines is the rights. Um, the right is making the argument there's a substantive right to own uh, guns. That they those cannot be taken away from me. That that's a fundamental right so important that no amount of procedure, no amount of debate or or uh, due process in the legislature talking about regular. That's a substantive due process argument that this right to own a gun trumps everything. Uh, now, on the left, there, there's there's substantive right, sub, uh, substantive due process argument, too. Uh, a lot of times it boils down to uh, privacy type stuff. So my point to students is this isn't the domain of one side of the political aisle. Both sides of the political aisle do like substantive due pro uh, process. It's just for different things. Professor Williams? Yeah, I would just add on to that and say, even though this question is using a Supreme Court quote, and I think the first bullet point is what the Supreme Court's doing, um, I don't think this, you, rattling off Supreme Court cases and how one court found this court, that's that's not as interesting as I think the, as I think the conversation we were just having, like, what are the cultural and political implications of this? And um, what notions of being, like, as an American citizen, what do you and your colleagues think it, what are the fundamental rights that you have? And are they in the constitution or not? And what would that, you know, what does that mean moving forward? I, I think the, that type of critical thinking is much better than just being able to cite off this case, this incorporation. Um, I, yeah, you can Wikipedia that. Have a good conversation with yourself about the cultural, political implications of all this. All right. Well, that brings us to the end of our time together for this first episode. I have a few points I'd like to share with our listeners. Uh, 
This year, for a variety of reasons, we got a much later start than we have in the past seasons. And because of that and our desire to try to provide as much help to as many students as possible, uh, as I think you all know, we're working off of a script of 18 different questions that students are asked to deal with. And uh, we've come to the conclusion that we don't need to do all 18, uh, that we have previous episodes that uh, in so many ways deal with uh, the questions that you're gonna be asked. And Professor Moore will be in time uh, sharing with you those previous episodes that should help you uh, address uh, your questions. So we're open to touch on 12 of the 18 uh, by the beginning of uh, December uh, there. And then and, and finally, uh, this episode is being uh, taped, if you wanna call that, uh, uh, on the day that uh, Queen Elizabeth passed away after 70 years as, uh, as monarch, uh, Queen of England. And I'll say up front, I'm an Anglophile. Uh, I believe that the first and most fundamental mistake this country ever made was getting rid of a monarch uh, and that we would have been best off following the path of Canada and Australia and having a head of state who's separate from the head of government uh, there, and I can see that my friends are already, you know, squirreling in their seats there. But uh, regardless if they agree with me, I think uh, uh, she will go down as one of the most significant figures in uh, history. And I've had my day of mourning uh, dealing with her death. And I do believe the monarchy will not survive King Charles III. Uh, and so we're looking for some really wonderful disruption uh, in the England and Empire and the Commonwealth uh, here over the next few years. So uh, next session, we're going to be dealing with civil discourse, and we're going to see whether or not uh, this group can practice civil discourse uh, here. So we look forward to seeing you. Until then, peace, love, yogurt tacos. Bye-bye, bye-bonds.